Okay. Um, morning, everybody, and uh, and and welcome. It's it's great to see so many people joining us this morning. Uh, my name is Jonathan McAlpin. I am a chief executive of East Belfast Enterprise here in Belfast, in the UK. Uh, and we are joined today with our, our partners from um, Germany, uh, Ireland, um, the Netherlands and Denmark. Uh, that's the partnership that has been working on this project, uh, the, the Eminent project. Eminent is uh, an EU Erasmus funded project that we, we embarked in back in September 2019, long before uh, certainly I knew anything about social distancing or hand sanitizing, uh, or indeed COVID-19, but uh, here we are now in the all too familiar um, circumstances of staring at faces down a, a computer screen. Um, and I know that can't, that isn't always the easiest, but we feel we've got a really good and lively event for you this morning and hope that you'll find that this has been a valuable use of your time uh, to join in and, and hear more about our project. So the project, the Eminent Project, what is that? It's, um, it's a project that we have designed uh, to support female migrant entrepreneurs, um, uh, as an, an area of growth uh, across the, the EU, um, and a, an area that has not had a lot of attention or research in the past. So we have been uh, working hard as a partnership to pull together some uh, resources and materials which we'll share more about uh, later on in, uh, in this morning's event. I should have said from the outset also that we will be recording this event purely for, as, as a, an opportunity to share the information that, that uh, is recorded here and make that uh, freely available uh, through our portal at a later date. So if you're uncomfortable about um, being seen or viewed on the recording, you can turn off your cameras, but if, uh, like me, you don't really have too many concerns about that. Um, you're more than welcome just to, to keep the camera rolling. The other thing I should say is that throughout the event, we will be disseminating uh, information about the event. We'll be sharing uh, screenshots and various uh, other aspects. Um, we will be doing that through the, the hashtag um, eminentproject.eu. And uh, my colleague, uh, Paul from Roscommon, will put that into the chat function. So if uh, you want to um, use that hashtag to disseminate your own information, please do so. Be very happy and keen for you to do that. Um, the other thing, just a piece of housekeeping, is uh, we would really appreciate uh, if you would be willing to help evaluate our um, event today. And to do that, uh, my colleague, uh, Kenny, is going to put a link into the uh, chat function also. It'll just be a click to uh, a very, very short survey, I promise you, only three or four questions, very easy to complete. And we'd be very keen if uh, you would help us by um, by completing that whenever you leave the event. So look, thank you if uh, in advance for doing that. Okay, so um, I'm sure you don't really wanna sit and listen to me all the time. So I wanna move into the first, uh, uh, contributor this morning um, to our event. This is going to be an easy one for me because we're going to start off with uh, a bit of a conversation. And the conversation is going to be with myself and a, a really good friend of mine and of ours in uh, in Belfast here, Roisin McDermott. Uh, Roisin previously used to run the organization that I'm um, now uh, chief executive of, and she then went out to become herself a female entrepreneur. So Roisin knows only too well what it is to be that uh, that female entrepreneur trying to build her business. Um, and her business is also uh, incredibly relevant because Roisin is a business mentor and trainer and has focused uh, her career on supporting other female entrepreneurs. So, um, so without further ado, I would like to welcome uh, Roisin and Firstly, just to say hi, Roshin, and you can give us Jonathan, a wee wave. how are you doing? There you go. Brilliant. Oh, okay, listen, Roshin, as I said, it's great to have you here. And uh, and this is very much a, a bit of informal chat. But what I'm going to hope to do is just to uh, pose a couple of questions to Roshin and let her uh, share some of her experience and expertise from working in that field of female entrepreneurship. So, Roshin, maybe just to kick us off, um, 
Why have you focused your career on female entrepreneurship? Well, good morning, everybody. And look, it's lovely to be here. I know I met um, I met a lot of people uh, when I was doing this, this massive research task of trying to take everybody's individual reports and uh, summarize them. So it's always when we get a little call from Kenny, oh, we need you for a wee thing, and it turns into a massive thing. So, um, But really, really insightful, interesting um, projects. So delighted to be part of this. So so yes, I'm the woman who was the pre-runner to, to Jonathan. So there's always a good woman goes first, you see, in, in this world. So um, yes, I'm just up the road. Would much rather be sitting in Amsterdam here today or maybe even in, in uh, Roscommon would do fine. But here we are in Belfast. So yes, Jonathan, um, I worked in the enterprise agency scene for a while before I went self-employed. And I suppose if I go back 20 years um, where I was in East Belfast, we did not have women who came through our door very frequently. So um, we at the time, of course, were running pre-startup programs, startup programs. And I would have been at that time in my 20s, uh, a nice young girl, and um, maybe 20, 25 percent of people who came through the door were women. So I find that really shocking, surprising. And of course, you know, we we at the time, Belfast is still very much recovering from the troubles. And, um, you know, it was early days. So I got involved because I saw that real gap. So that was probably the first thing. But then more from a personal level, um, about 13 years ago, after I had my second child, I had literally two children under two and I was working a full time management job and I crashed. So um, like any good woman, you're trying to work a full time job. You've suddenly had babies. The hormones are everywhere. My husband worked in England most of the time and it was all too much. So I suppose I, I then actually developed some health issues. But I suppose from that, I have great empathy for women. A lot of women who start up businesses, yes, there are the women with the amazing idea and I have this great idea. But and it's the same with men, of course, but there are a lot of women and men who start businesses because of transition in their lives. They've had an obstacle. They've been made redundant. They're not getting promoted in work. They've gone off on maternity leave. Get a job because their marketing skills are out of date. So it's it's a sort of a natural pathway. A lot of women I find starting up business have hit obstacles. So I kind of find on a personal level, look, I've great empathy. I, I get them. I understand them. I've been there. I've I've had those obstacles. So that's another reason. But the third thing, probably, and probably the biggest driver is. I, of course, used to work on mixed gender programs, and I still do a lot on social economy and stuff. Um, and um, But there was some sort of thing when I worked just with women. There's some sort of magic on a women's only program, a magic that happens that I just love. And I have seen much greater impact of the programs that I've been involved in, which are female only, you know, in terms of results, in terms of startups, in terms of sustainability, and in terms of confidence. So I suppose that's a few different reasons there that have brought me on this pathway. Thank, thanks, Roshin. Yeah, absolutely. And, and maybe just to pick up on the, um, you mentioned there about the that, that sort of magic that you find whenever in that uh, all-female environment. And, uh, you know, there are some out there who are cynics of this, uh, who sort of say, like, why do we need female-only interventions? Um, surely, surely we can just have interventions open to all and anybody. Um, and, and they maybe look quite negatively on this. Mm. Um, why do you think we need these separate interventions, such as what we're trying to do here with the Eminent Project? Well, I suppose from a, a government and policy perspective, I mean, in the UK, we've certainly got great arguments uh, and statistics are, are there to back up why we, we need female intervention. I mean, um, there was a great piece of research, as some of you may be familiar with, that was done um, in 2019 by the Royal Bank of Scotland called the Alison Rose Report. And it does sort of give some statistics, which I'll share later on all European countries. But I mean, the, the, the statistics are in terms of startups were for every 10 men start. So that, that statistic shows, OK, they're not starting a business. There's also a lot of content in that as well about they don't grow their businesses, they don't hire staff, they don't seek investment, they're less inclined to take risks. So there's a lot of stuff there on a government level. But I suppose for, more from my perspective, um, why we need separate interventions. I mean, 
I, there are some women who I would find will be attracted to come on a female only program and they, they wouldn't go, maybe they won't be attracted in the same way to a male only program for why that is. Um, but I think there's something safe about being on a female only program where they are more relaxed, it doesn't feel competitive, it doesn't feel that they're being judged the same. Um, women can just sort of relax, they can you know, while any program I run is focused on business skills, it's not airy fairy. It's not, oh, let's talk resilience and confidence. They're not, they're business, but we allow space in those programs for women to be themselves, to share the problems. Do you know, if you want to have a whinge about kids or your teenagers or whatever, that that's all okay. Because in a way, I find that a woman doesn't launch a good business or doesn't start that business if she's not in the right place in terms of her confidence and where she's at. So I suppose it's really about that, creating the right environment for them to flourish. I find you can do in a female only. And I've had greater um, outputs in terms of startups and sustainability of business when it's female only. Thanks, Roisin. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and I can understand that. Maybe people uh, feel more comfortable to, to open up. Uh, although I have to say, I like to whinge about my kids as well, if uh, anybody ever likes to listen. <laughs> But, uh, good on, good on you. Yeah, yeah. Just more about me. Um, no, listen. Uh, I, I wanted to maybe move on into the Eminent Project a bit uh, itself, and and in, and you did a lot of work for us uh, uh, through this project and some of the uh, yeah. research that's fed into the first of our our outputs. Um, and just from from carrying out that, I'd be interested to hear uh, when you've looked at some of the interventions across uh, Europe that there to support female migrant entrepreneurs. Has it seemed to you to be a fairly sort of uniform uh, level of provision or are there countries that approach this very differently? Um, well, I did find the whole thing of trying to each country, um, each partner did their own report and then I tried to pull those together and I did find there was a lot of variation and um, in terms of what's on the ground, in terms of government's perspective, um, like in, in UK and Ireland, um, when I talk about the UK, I'm really referring more to Northern Ireland because that's where I did the practical work and the research and my knowledge. But we're similar, um, you know, since 2003 um, or it's two, sorry, 2013, the Irish government have had a complete female entrepreneurship strategy in place and lots of network and events programmes. Northern Ireland, where we a bit more peace, me, you know, um, we've had a great program in place the past three years for female entrepreneurs called Yes, You Can, and other projects are a little maybe more ad hoc. So that's on female enterprise. Then when you go down in those countries to female migrants, not really, you know, um, we, we have some nice best practice examples in there of small programs. I know Jonathan, your organization did one, the New Beginnings, but these things tend to be you know, you get a bit of funding, you run it, you pilot it, you think it's good, you don't get the money again, and, and that's the way it goes. So, so, so some nice examples, yes. Um, Germany was, was different. Um, we found there really, you know, Germany, the unemployment rate is very, very low. So the focus of the government is very much on migrants, is about uh, employment, and they, they tend to seek job, jobs rather than self-employment, although, you know, a lot of the, cult, the, the the people coming there, their cultural background, like the Syrians, you know, 32% of them would have actually been self-employed in their own country before. So there is the opportunity there, but it doesn't tend to be the focus of the German government. Also on female entre enterprise, there's not a great focus either. In Germany, we tended to find the support that exists. It tends to be more online support, learning platforms, digital stuff, information, not actual come on a training course or come and create a project as such. Um, the Netherlands, I found very interesting um, because, I mean, if we look at the statistics in Netherlands, even their rate of startups is much higher than the rest of us. Their rate of... Um, of a sort of males to females there's you know the, the the number of females who start compared to males is much higher than the rest of us as well so so I was very interested in looking when um, at the reports that they had written um, and yes it, it does sort of back up lots of best practice examples there particularly in around the areas of Rotterdam Amsterdam um, projects focused on migrant women um, but of course, as well, the numbers of migrant women that they would have compared to the likes of us are much, much bigger. So, yes, there's definitely some nice projects there that could be looked at further. But again, they did mention problems with, you know, you get some funding and then you lose it as well. 
Thanks, Russian. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, that's certainly our experience. Um, you know, it, it, it's uh, about how often it can be piecemeal. It can be short term interventions, short term, almost pilot interventions, um, which are then quite hard to bring into the mainstream. And that can be a, a bit of a challenge. And you, you mentioned earlier about, um, you know, government policy. And you can see from what you said there that across the uh, the union, there are different approaches from different governments to this, and different emphasis put. Um, but I'm going to uh, I'm going to maybe help to tie off our conversation uh, before we go into hear more about some of the uh, the projects uh, from the different countries um, by maybe giving you an opportunity and saying that if you could talk to those governments or talk to those policy makers, what would be the one thing or a couple of things that you would say to them? Uh, that would really be make a difference to help uh, female migrant entrepreneurs? Well, I think, Jonathan, that female migrant entrepreneurs have so many barriers against them, cultural language and all the rest. And, and one of the biggest barriers that seemed to be coming across was the language skills. And then, you know, they don't want to start a business because they don't have the language skills. But um, the thing that I would go for, if, if there was a pot of money, and they said, right, what should we spend this on? I would um, encourage some sort of a social enterprise approach. So you get women into groups, they'll work better in teams and groups. They might work on a voluntary basis at the start and they do something and they go out and they learn business skills by doing rather than business plans, rather than PowerPoint presentations. Um, there are some nice examples. There's a lovely example in, in the Netherlands of women who were making clothing and then had a clothing shop while learning Dutch. I mean, fantastic. But I think they did say, costly to run, problems getting refunded. Um, nice example here in Northern Ireland. I know a lady um, who runs Art Sector, who all of the women, the Asian women, were all making art and crafts. And she's trying to get funding to set it up as a social enterprise to sell them. So anything that is about making, doing, you know, could they run a pop-up cafe? Could they sell products in their own area? Could they run a cleaning business in the community? Whatever skills they happen to have, but they're out and, and sell. The message that Russian is trying to get across there, which is about the, the need to provide an intervention that allows people to, to work together, to maybe uh, to feel more comfortable with, within uh, a, a tight-knit group where they feel they can share more, uh, more closely. Um, and remove some of those fears and some of those initial barriers that then can help people to build that confidence, build that knowledge and take forward perhaps into their own intervention and, and uh, have the courage to, to branch out on their own. And I suppose it's, it's that that we want to uh, look at in a little bit more uh, detail now. Um, there's uh, my colleagues uh, that have been working on this project with us have been reaching out into their communities to find uh, entrepreneurs and people who are working with uh, female entrepreneurs um, to look at, at how, how they have developed their journey and to learn from their experiences. So we want to try to uh, share that uh, with you now into the, as we move into the, the next section of our agenda. And I'm going to welcome uh, to the uh, virtual platform my colleague, uh, Eva. Eva was seeing from um, uh, Nuerderport uh, in uh, the Netherlands. Uh, and Eva is going to uh, bring us through the story um, with her colleague, Karen. Uh, I hope I've got those names correct. Um, and if I haven't, apologies. But if I could pass on, and just before I do, sorry, I see Roshin's back. Roshin, thank you so much. I know it. it sorry, I don't know where I got cut off. There. We we cut the last bit, but listen, we 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 uh, did get the message. Get and, the point. And, and we got the point. And like, thank you very much for your intervention. Really appreciate it. Okay. So I'm moving on, and I'm going to invite uh, Eva. Eva, if you want to take the take the platform and uh, take it forward with uh, with Karen. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Jonathan, for the introduction. Um, my name is Eva Hoitzing. I'm a policy advisor at um, Noorderpoort, which is a large, large vocational college in uh, Groningen in the Netherlands, in the north. Next to me is my colleague Sharon, 
uh, who's hosting the event with me today. Um, and I have been working with um, Karun indeed, and I hope she will be online. Yeah, she is yes. online. Yes. Well. I'm online. <laughs> Hi, Karun. Yes. Hi. Um, so Karun is from Syria, living in Groningen um, for some years already, and has started a very successful entrepreneurial career in music. Um, so I hope, Karun, that you will tell us something more about that. Um, how did you become an entrepreneur? What challenges did you face? And, and your successful elements. Yeah. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. We are there. <laughs> Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Yeah. Mm. yeah, I graduated in Syria in 2003 and I started working uh, immediately. So it was uh, there very simple, very easy because I yeah, I started in a, at the conservatory. I was playing at the National Symphony Orchestra there. So it was very simple to continue my uh, work there and to build up a career. And I was teaching at the conservatory also. So, but when we came, uh, I, uh, I came with my uh, husband and my, uh, our son in 2015. So it was very difficult uh, and we had to to study again here. So we did our masters here in music uh, to be able to work here because with Syrian diploma is not, yeah, it's not <laughs> allowed to work here. So we did the masters, but we had also to work to, uh, to, put, uh, to be able to live here. So I started working, I, uh, I started with my, uh, um, Drive. What is the drive? <laughs> uh, uh, um, uh, yeah, I forgot the English because I'm talking uh, always uh, in Dutch, so my English is uh, becoming yeah. <laughs> not, it's fine. It's fine. You you start yeah. your your own business. Your company is who is business. with my company. My Compliment. business is current Music, and uh, to be able to uh, teach the children because I like to teach children, I, I had to learn also Dutch. It was also a challenge for me. So I I was studying here master and I, uh, I was learning the Dutch. So it was not so easy. And uh, so now, uh, now before Corona, I can say I was playing with uh, several orchestras and uh, I'm teaching uh, cello. Uh, I'm uh, assistant by uh, Hello Cell Orchestra, it's a very big orchestra with 160 children who are playing cello together in uh, Amsterdam every two years. Um, yeah, so I'm proud what I did uh, till now, but it wasn't uh, easy. And uh, yeah, but uh, because I had experience before, uh, so it was more yeah, accessible to me to 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 continue here. All right, thank you, Karun. That's a very nice, a very nice journey that you had with quite some challenges along the way. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I think you are opening your music school today here in Berlin. Not, <laughs> not alone. So not we are no, no, not alone. We are twenty-three teachers, music teachers here in Groningen, and uh, Saturday we will open it in uh, uh, in Norderplatzen. Uh, so we will play with a, with a young orchestra uh, of uh, 30 children, and we are as uh, teachers are playing with them. And uh, yeah, it's just the beginning of, uh, of the music school. It's Music House 050. Very nice, it's, it's great, really. So does does anyone have a question for Karun? Maybe you can ask a question in the chat as well, um, or just unmute yourself. Yeah, Karun, can I have a? Hi. Thank you so much for your story. It's really inspiring. Uh, my question is about your ecosystems. Um, how 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 were your surroundings or ecosystems involved when you started the New Life Choir, one of the most beautiful uh, innovations in music uh, for the last four years in the Netherlands? Yeah, actually, I didn't start the New Life because they were are uh, 
started in the AZC in Groningen. Uh, we were in Eindhoven then, back, and uh, but they asked us to uh, contact them, to uh, uh, teach them. So we started with them in 2018. Um, so we are working with them uh, two years or three years now. And yeah, uh, we we didn't want to to work with them as all only uh, uh, Flüchtlingen uh, choir, but we didn't want uh, we uh, we want to make them like a real amateurs uh, choir. So they are singing good. They are singing that uh, that everyone can uh, listen to them. Not because they are they are only Syrian, but because they are singing normally like amateur choir. So uh, we hope that they are doing well. And uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, for me it's very important that we didn't we are not treated as only Syrian people. We we have our color, uh, so we are from different color from different culture. But we are adding something to uh, to the Dutch uh, color. But uh, yeah, we are we are different, but we are not different. <laughs> so it's a new color, I think. Thank thank you, Karen. Uh, yeah, there are a lot of questions in the chat. I think. I see, yes, and lots of congratulations as well. Thank Important, you. So, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, um, the hardest part of the business side, yeah, is to understand the new society. It's uh, very difficult. So it's not that you are uh, you are not only busy with yeah, your business. You have to understand the people, communication. And yeah, it was very different in the beginning to understand people. And uh, yeah, I think uh, it's getting better, but it's not always easy. Uh, congratulations, thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, yeah, my Dutch is, is better than my English, sorry. <laughs> um, Great, Your English is fine though, really. <laughs> Your Don't worry. Business in Groningen. Did you already have experience with entrepreneurship? Yeah, my expectation, like as musician, was uh, bigger in the beginning because I was working with children, very young children in Syria, uh, children from three to eight years old. And when I came, it was uh, like a shock that the children, uh, that the children in this. Uh, in uh, uh, in this age, they are not doing music. So the first that uh, they have to go to swimming lesson, then it's football. So uh, sport is more important than music. So for me, it was a shock. Uh, but yeah, it's a new uh, experience to deal with uh, with parents and to let them understand that the music is also important, like a sport. Uh, sport is important, but music is all is uh, it's necessary. So that was uh, difficult, and uh, yeah, entrepreneurship. Yeah, the for me, yeah, I started everything. So uh, I went everywhere to 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 play in orchestras. I went everywhere to to teach in schools. So. Yeah, I was searching, not people were searching uh, me. Uh, so I did a lot in Friesland, in Groningen, in Drenthe. So I didn't stop working and searching. And uh, I'm trying now to uh, to make a closer uh, circle, the uh, smaller circle, because I'm yeah tired to to uh, to be everywhere. So I'm trying now to be more in Groningen. Uh, administration thing it's very difficult uh, it was very difficult but now I'm, I'm using to do it uh, so it's fine a new color yes <laughs> uh, Eva, yeah, th um, yeah. I, I, th I think uh, you know and, and thank you Karen, for your uh, inspiring story it really has been uh, 
uh, it really has been in, uh, inspiring to hear how somebody can travel from uh, an area that, such as Syria and not just uh, um, be able to start to create entrepreneurship and, and, uh, and new life, but also uh, in a new language and learning uh, Dutch and then being able to present to us here today in English. Uh, that's something that's just, that blows my mind. I don't know how you, you do that. So, <laughs> so I'm, I'm truly inspired and uh, and I really want to thank you. I've, I've noticed Eva has has put um, the web address in the chat for for people uh, if you would like to learn more. And uh, please do. I'm sure uh, Karen would be very happy for you to engage with her through that website. Um, and just can I can I thank you and can I thank you for your intervention? Um, and maybe if uh, if it's okay, we could uh, move to take the spotlight from the Netherlands and swiftly move it uh, to somewhere just slightly south of where I'm sitting right now, uh, to a rural part of Ireland. And I'm yes. going to... Say uh, quickly, thank sorry, you so Eva. much, Karen, for sharing your st story. Very happy to have you here today. And you can quickly hurry on to your next meeting, as I know you have a busy day. So yes. thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I will send you also the, the our website with our trio. Ah, very good. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I see it. Okay. Thank you, Karen. Bye -bye. Really appreciate Bye -bye. it. Thank you. So yeah, we'll we'll move uh, to uh, rural Ireland now, and I'm going to uh, welcome my colleague uh, Paul Paul Clabby from uh, Roscommon, uh, and I'm going to ask Paul. I know is going to uh, have a conversation and open up uh, uh, another example of. Um, an entrepreneur who has uh, made her uh, life in uh, rural Ireland. So, Paul, over to you. Thanks a million, Jonathan, and thanks, Karen, for your presentation there for the very insightful one. Um, so we're moving, yes, it's nearly like Eurovision, Jonathan. Uh, we're coming to Roscommon uh, here at the minute. And, um, yeah, similar, we have our own stories here and our own uh, exciting entrepreneurial uh, journeys to share with you this morning. Um, I'm delighted, I suppose, to be joined, first of all, by some of our colleagues here in Roscommon Leader Partnership. And for those that are unaware, uh, we're a local development company here in Roscommon supporting rural community and enterprise development. Um, so, yes, uh, we're delighted to be joined also here today um, by Katia Denova, entrepreneur, community champion, ambassador for all things good about Roscommon, I have to say. Um, she really is an incredible lady. Um, came to Brazil, came from Brazil uh, to Roscommon um, a few years back and um, has been involved in different areas in the town. But more importantly, and what today is about, Katya is an entrepreneur and uh, we're going to just talk a little bit about Katya and her business, which is called Rummage, which is basically a brilliant uh, furniture store with a twist that sells antique, vintage and retro style furniture. Um, and basically, as Katya likes to say, she saves stuff from going to timber heaven, so giving new life to lots of different um, household products. So Katya, um, we're going to have a little discussion. We're going to try and uh, learn a bit about you uh, and your business, and uh, hopefully um, we'll, we, we'll give an inspiring interview today. So Katya, can you tell us a little bit about you, your move to Ireland, and what motivated you to set up your own business here in Roscommon? Hello, everybody. Hi, I'm from I'm Katz. I'm here in the west of Ireland, and uh, thank you for. I'm so delighted to be participate today. I came to Ireland, the west of Ireland, to Roscommon, a small town, in 2001, uh, with a group of friends with no English, and I'm here to survive. <laughs> I'm still here. And uh, um, yeah, it was a great it was a great opportunity to come to Ireland, it's especially with uh, being so far away and moving to Europe that everyone loved to come. It was nice to come with the friends. Uh, first, I um, came with work permit to work in a factory, uh, work in a factory for two years. And from that, I have been working so many different Oh, is there so many different kinds of different jobs I do? And um, 
I working for retail, working in uh, retail for a while. And I think this gives me a great opportunity to be dealing with people and to the confidence with no English. So the, the small English that I have, I think was great to work in a retail first. And from that gave me the confidence, I think, to open and open my own business. The passion with um, antiques and the vintage always was in the, my background always was, and the, with the upcycling as well, always that's why is that my part of the business more is that my part of the business, the upcycling. And I think the upcycling is, uh, I think from the last couple of years, we can say maybe 10 years is a huge, is a huge problem. And probably you no, know, England is a big, big thing in North Ireland is a big thing. And the Ireland, I think with the upcycle, they just came a little bit behind, but came and um, yeah. So in 2018, um, with the courage, with the passion, <laughs> I remember before we opened the shop, the house was, uh, wasn't able to move because we have everything storage and uh, with the passion for, for antiques and the house was a big. So in 2018, we decided to open a uh, Romage. Romage is antique collectibles, the uh, upcycling furniture in Roscommon in small town in Ireland. Perfect, perfect. Thanks, Katya. And I suppose you've given us an insight into Romage. Uh, and the beautiful business. And I've just shared a link to your website there for people to catch a glimpse of your lovely store located on Castle Street in Roscommon. Thank uh, you, some Paul. Some of the different services that you, you, you provide there. I suppose, Katya, just another question because we're, we're, we're trying to support and ignite female migrant mm -hmm. entrepreneurship. Um, can you tell us maybe some of what were the barriers or some of the challenges that you, I uh, suppose, encountered along your entrepreneurial journey? Oh, we, we definitely, we do have a lot of barriers. I think it, um, first, for, in my, in my perspective, uh, being a migrant and a woman, I think that is a huge because uh, it's uh, for you, first, for you work in a retail, to be in a work in a retail as a staff is, is one thing. But to be working in a retail as a, as an owner of a shop is a is a huge is a is a, is a, is a big yeah. thing. Uh, I don't think maybe people kind of expect that yet, but it's is um, it's good. It's really good, and I, for the other side as well, give other people. Uh, a chance to to see that to be able to do will be able to that can happen so that in my perspective as a woman in my grant that's one uh, one um, one good point you know when people like for people follow the true the, the true law of what they want to do and the, the, as a business the barrier i think always i think is money definitely is one big barrier is in the business Money is a, especially in retail, if um, you know, you need the, the phones for that. So uh, our phones wasn't big, it was small. We have um, put some money aside. And, uh, and from that, we, we carry on what we, we love to do. And, um, but for, for our business, our type of business, the barrier is um, we always need to collect. We always need to collect. We need a big stock. We, we don't have, uh, we don't have like, if you open, a, a, if you have a shop, a, a, new, a new furniture shop, you have your supply that you can go and buy from your supplier. So you can put an order every month and with, your, with what you want to get from them and they will send it to you and you'll be arriving in your door. So for us, no, we always to have, we have to have connections. We need to, we need to, 
to look for a stock. We always need to look for a stock. We always need to attend the auctions. We always in the hunt for a stock because um, it, one week you can go well and the other week you can go kind of slow, but stock sometimes can, can move quick, but sometimes as well not. But you always need to that crop stuff. You always need something different. Sometimes one supply can to offer that one crop stuff, the other one can offer different stuff. So it's always not hot. You always the stock, I think is the big barrier too. You always need the stock. Brilliant, brilliant. Well, Kasia, thanks so much for giving us a taste uh, of your business. Um, thanks so much for being involved in this project. Um, I'm going to share a link to the case study for a more in-depth interview that we've done with you recently. And on behalf of Roscommon Leader Partnership, uh, the Eminent Project team and everyone here today, we wish you continued success with the business and also as our community champion, we wish you the very best in all walks of life going forward. So that's it, folks, from Ireland. That's Katia and our wonderful rummage business. So thank you very much, Katia. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, to share these lovely, lovely stories. Roisin, I love her. Her talking was very good. And she is, you know, she did a lovely research. And it's very important. And it's lovely to hear as well, the lady, the music lady, and it's, yeah, I'll be staying here watching you all. <laughs> thank, thank you, Katia, and thank you, Paul. Uh, yeah, I, I, I uh, in, endorse your comments, Paul, and um, and uh, yet another uh, very inspirational uh, story, um, you know, and it's, it's those stories of inspiration that really uh, drive what we want to do here to, to, to help more of this uh, across across Europe and I guess in the true spirit of Eurovision that means that we can switch across now to uh, Halle in Germany um, and uh, I would welcome my colleague uh, David, David Blunk from uh, the Vision Works in Halle uh, and um, just welcome you David to maybe share a case study in, uh, from a German perspective. Yes, uh, thank you, Jonathan. Um, the the case study I will present now um, actually actually fits very very much to what we just heard. Um, it's also about the fashion industry and also about um, circular e economy. Um, and I will present um, the case study of Kleiderli, um, a German company founded by Alina Bassi. Alina, unfortunately, cannot be here today, um, but I have the opportunity or the pleasure to um, introduce her story. Um, and at the end of my presentation, you will also hear some, some words from her directly. Can you see my presentation? Does it work? Perfect. So, um, yes, uh, I want to int introduce um, Alina. Um, Alina is um, a chemical engineer. She's um, Indian by heritage. Um, she grew up um, in the UK um, and then later on founded her company in Germany. Um, her parents actually were born and raised in Tanzania. So um, yeah, uh, Alina actually combines uh, a lot of different cultures and um, different perspectives. Um, Alina founded her company in 2019. Um, the company is called Kleiderly, but she also, um, with her experience in being a female migrant entrepreneur, she initiated uh, a very interesting project for entrepreneurs um, called Tech in Color. Um, Tech in Color is a, is a project um, that actually focuses on um, female migrant entrepreneurs um, looking for startup investing uh, or startup investment. Um, and let's go a little bit more into the background of Alina's personal story. So um, Alina is very passionate um, about um, sustainability, about climate change. Um, actually, since she was 14, when she first learned about climate change and yeah, let's say the um, the topics that that we face. 
Um, she then decided to study chemical engineering with the aim of working in the field of uh, sustainability and energy, and then worked in the industry for about eight years. Um, and there she gained the important experience to found her own company. So I will introduce very shortly what Clyde Ali does. Um, first, starting with the problem. Um, one of the learning that Alina gave us is um, for a startup, you need to provide solutions for a problem or a need. And, and here the need is, is obvious um, because 87% of the textiles end up that we buy end up in landfills or incinerators. And around 80% of all our clothing includes some blend of plastics which do not biodegrade and therefore do not decompose. On the other hand, when textiles go to incinerators, they are burned producing heavy metals actually and um, air pollution. So most plastics used today um, are derived from petrochemicals sourced from crude oil. So um, if plastic usage is not limited, actually um, we will have more plastic in the sea than fish by 2050. So that's one of the problems Alina wanted to work on. Um, so garments are produced every 100 billion garments are produced every single year with a number set to rise to 150 by 2050. As said, 87% of all textiles used for clothing, clothing end up in landfills or are burned. 400 million tons of plastic are produced annually worldwide from non-renewable fossil, fossil fuels and 5.5 kilo of textile waste are produced per person in Europe annually. So how does Alina and Clyerly want to um, tackle those problems? So um, first, she wants to lower the impact of clothing waste disposal and reduce the usage of oil-based plastics. So what she does is actually she collects used clothings and then transfers them into a reusable um, material that actually um, you can use such as plastics, for example, for sunglasses or other garments. So, so this is a 100% circular concept. But we don't want to talk that much about Clyderly, actually. Um, I think it's more important to let Alina talk about um, her learnings from her startup story. So um, we produced a short video and you, see, you can actually see the, the full video on our website as well. Um, and I would like to um, give the word to Alina. Last the reason time, for moving to Germany was um, you know, a decision we made as a couple, but it was actually a mixture of a few things, uh, you know, Brexit making it um, difficult to move to Europe after Brexit was official. We wanted to do it before. Um, and we didn't really want to be stuck um, to living in one place, but have that freedom of movement. Uh, without the language, it's extremely difficult. And to be honest, without my husband, who is our co-founder, I couldn't have done it because he has to navigate the um, the language aspect that I think the, the hardest thing was even just setting up a new gear or understanding what's a new gear in a gear in Bihar. Or, um, you know, in, in the UK, you can you can set up a business online in pretty much five minutes. Understanding all the different company structures, core gear, gear, what are they all? And then actually, uh, actually filing a business was really difficult. So yeah, I couldn't have done it without him or without a German speaker. Having a different cultural background means that you see, you see life in different ways. You know, you see how, you know, people live in Europe. I see how people live in, in India, for example, because I'm in, in Indian by heritage, but my parents were born and raised in Tanzania. So I also have 
an understanding of how things work in in East Africa. So I see things from completely different angles that maybe others haven't experienced or seen so close. Um, And I also find that my cultural background enables me to understand uh, cultural differences really well and, and potentially have more empathy with people I work with or new people I meet. So I joined um, an accelerator here called High Tech Seed Lab, and um, that was extremely beneficial because they provide you with uh, funding and they also provide you with support from the state um, with everything related to founding a business, to finding the right types of lawyers and notaries. Um, And without this, I think I would have found the whole process a lot more cumbersome, but having their support to just you know, slowly build your network was really helpful. I think it's from the European Social Fund. And there's a lot of different uh, companies using the European Social Fund to fund different businesses here. So there's uh, Berlin Founders Fund. um, And also, I think the Berlin Startup Stupendium. And all of these, I think the money comes from the same pot, but extremely helpful. And I think anyone starting a business um, has such great support by using one of these accelerator programs. It's not about being motivated because it's easy to be motivated, but it's about being committed. You have to be committed on the days where everything is falling apart or you're getting no's from everyone and um, you have to be resilient and just keep going. And that was a really hard lesson to learn. Um, That, you know, everything is not going to go your way. You have to just keep going now, you know, and, and kind of be this person who's saying that, you know, no one's going to stop me. I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to keep going and nothing's going to get me down. To sharing and you keep your idea to yourself because you think um, it might sound stupid. You're not going to be able to get other people's feedback and you need that in order to be able to grow. So yeah, that that was Alina's story. Um, if you're interested in the full um, story and her full learnings from from her startup journey, um, please go to our website and um, you can see the full story here. So those were just um, short short parts of um, our conversation with Alina. Um, Yes, and if you have any questions, um, please feel free to ask. Um, I hope I can answer them. (laughs) Thank you, David. Uh, And there could be opportunities later in the session also to ask questions. We will have a panel um, discussion to finish the the session and and, uh, any questions can also be put into the um, the chat box as we go uh, and they can be brought up to our panelists at at that point. Um, so the, thank you, David. And again, another very interesting uh, story. And this one, um, you know, the, the you know, climate change and, and what's happening to our seas. Could uh, is there is there any uh, bigger an issue that we're trying to deal with right now? Um, so uh, incredible to hear uh, the the story there of how uh, we have another migrant uh, female entrepreneur uh, from. A background from so many different cultures, being able to bring her knowledge and her expertise uh, to start a company in, in Germany. So thank you, David. And I'm, I'm going to move us on to uh, the next section on our uh, agenda, which is to look at um, some of the, uh, the the open educational resources. And uh, I'm going to invite in my colleagues again. Uh, it, it features David, and this time he, David will be joined by uh, Orla. Casey Orla, uh, our colleague from uh, also from Ireland, um, and I'm going to pass across to, to you guys. I think you're going to take us through um, some discussion around some of the resources. So over to you, Orla and David. Excellent. Thanks so much, Jonathan, and, and um, really enjoying this morning's um, session. And I think when we hear our case studies, it really brings home for us the value, I suppose, of Um, meeting exact needs of migrant women entrepreneurs and we've been very careful to do that in the full set of our deliverables so let let us tell you a little bit about those now Uh, David I'll start off if that's okay we'll start perhaps with with the um, 
with the training resources that we have developed. So Momentum um, uh, are vocation education trainers in, in Leitrim, but in Ireland, and we work all over Europe. Um, I am a female entrepreneur myself. Um, I started my first business 25 years ago and a little bit of a serial entrepreneur um, because it can get a little bit addictive. And I find a lot of the, the women that we, we share, um, their stories have, you know, have, more than one good business idea. So let's not restrict ourselves. And we were very careful, I suppose, to ensure there's lots of start your own business training in each of our countries. And we were really careful that we didn't want to replicate what was already there. You can do a financial course. You can do, you know, many, many different types of courses. We were very keen that we wanted to um, do something a little bit different, but that was going to tackle, I suppose, one of the key issues which was that motivation piece um getting the confidence to start and uh, feeling empowered to 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 um uh you know begin begin your business so um i'm just going to share my screen um you can see that okay and um, so literally this is you know entrepreneurship training with the difference um we put ourselves into the shoes of a female migrant entrepreneur um or, or woman who was um hoping to set up her own business First of all, you'll find um, the materials and all the other uh, deliverables of the Eminent Project on our website. So it's eminentproject.eu. And over here, I have highlighted our, uh, our, our course. So basically, this is a course that vocation education trainers can take and deliver in a classroom setting. And funny, we, we, we just com completed the piloting of this program. And so many of the women that did it, did it in an online environment. And the most... Uh, the most uh, popular suggestion that they had was, can we please get into a classroom to enjoy this course with our peers and others that are in a similar position? So hopefully that will happen from, from autumn onwards, that, that trainers will be allowed to get back into, into classrooms and deliver materials such as this. Um, we wrote the course with, um, with three different um, types of uh, female migrants and, and uh, refugees in mind. Um, those, I suppose, that, um, uh, that are, are, are first generation migrants, those that have, have moved to different countries for all types of different reasons, for economic, um, you know, social, better life, etc. Second generation, um, the, set, the children of migrants born in their adopted homeland um, and setting up a business, but have a unique perspective from a cultural background and that was very came across very strongly from our three speakers you know that cultural background is one of the most potent um uh, advantages a female uh, migrant entrepreneur has and also refugees who are seeking a better life but probably face more barriers um you know in terms of access to information and um and status so um we were very conscious to include include all um I will fly through this, but why do we need a specific course? Roisin mentioned earlier, why a separate uh, program for women? But why have we concentrated on this niche? Migrant men definitely have to go through more challenges. There's no doubt about it. Um, typically, and research shows that there's less money, less time and more challenges. Um, but do you know what? Sometimes those challenges are the biggest motivator of all. Um, Migrant women tend to possess strong social um, intelligence, and that's the capacity as well as knowing yourself and knowing others um, and being quite empathetic. Um, and that, that business idea can come from meeting a market need. Um, women in general make great communicators and listeners. Um, and this isn't just about language, which we know is really important and was mentioned a few times this morning. Um, that is one of the biggest challenges. But again, back to empathy. Empathy is one of the most underrated skills. And as we listen to customers and get, um, you know, come up with business ideas, uh, it, it really is a powerful tool. Um, migrant women are particularly adept at embracing change and tend to look to the future. This is, again, backed up by research. Um, and women in general um, collaborate. Um, you know, we've we tend to amplify other women's and we, we momentum my business we, we talk about the shine theory where we help another woman rise up 
when we help somebody else, we all shine. Um, and you should look up Shine Theory uh, on Google. It, it's a really interesting piece of work. And my good women are creative, um, you know, tend to think outside the box and, and or in that way can come up with better services and make better products. So quite general, but most of this is evidence-based. Um, but I suppose we're very careful that this set the tone for, for the training that followed. Um, we're going to be going into our breakout rooms um, uh, shortly, um, and we can look at these uh, the uh, course and the training that's available, uh, freely available, may I add, add, and available in English, German, and Dutch. Um, so we don't have to think in different languages. We can, you can do it. But basically, I suppose our course across six different um, steps is bringing the learners on this learning journey to gain the knowledge and skills to get the confidence to establish and successfully run their own business. So those steps are, um, I suppose, you know, the very starting point, you know, understanding what entrepreneurship is and where, you know, where it can bring you and your own, um, you know, your competencies and why entrepreneurship could be right for you um, we then move on to the business idea and qualifying that business and making sure that that, that idea is is good enough to to progress because um, so many businesses fail it and and many of many of the times we mentioned in the course you know just because there is a a niche in your market is there a market in your niche um, and that's really important so we then move on to once we've validated the idea make sure that you've done your research that is, you know we know that you're going to make money and um, we then move on to some of the practical aspects of getting your business started uh Cathy, you mentioned you know funding is absolutely uh, uh, uh really um important and critical part, um, we look at the finances and start funding behind your startup. Um, research only this week that I saw on LinkedIn was that women definitely face more challenges in attracting funding than men. And I'm going to share that research on the social media channels of Eminent later on today. I said women collaborate. So the power of collaboration is a standalone module because, again, together we can go further. Um, and how can we use our, our, our you know, working with others and their supporting team or those that we can find to help us bring our business forward. And a business plan is all very well, but unless you have the resilience and the confidence and the dogged determination to keep going while minding your well-being, um, you know, you really, um, you know, it, it, it's I for us, it's the final piece of the jigsaw, that well-being piece and the re resilience. And we, we go through some really interesting content in that final module. And we, we, we feel that then we have empowered you for, for action um, to set up your own business. So as I said, we're going to go into breakout rooms and we look at this in a little bit more detail. Um, so David, I'm going to uh, stop sharing and ask you to... To, to tell us about the self-assessment piece, that's an added bonus um, to the program. Um, wasn't originally in, in, included in the application, but thankfully you have come up with, with, with the, this beautiful extra content. Yeah, thank you, um, Orla. Um, yes, as you said, um, this, this additional um, resource wasn't originally planned. Um, but you mentioned a couple of um, topics or things um, that, that are already covered in the modules. Um, and we then decided that um, it would be um, an added value for, for the users um, that, that we um, develop a kind of low th threat uh, threshold um, assessment that allows potential female entrepreneurs to actually find out whether um, they are an entrepreneurial type or not. Um, and the assessment covers um, different personality areas and provides detailed feedback on which areas might still need to be improved or, or addressed. Um, so, so when you go on our website, and I will show you the uh, assessment live, it's just a five minutes assessment actually. Um, so when you go on our website, eminentproject.eu, 
if you don't have a pop-up blocker, there should be a pop-up that um, directly leads you to the assessment. If you have a pop-up blocker, you can also go to the resources section and then you find the entrepreneurship assessment. When you click on the entrepreneurship assessment, it directly opens up and it asks you to um, first provide some personal details, um, your email address, you can actually do that, but you can also leave it blank. If you enter your email address, um, it will directly send a feedback report to your mailbox. Um, if you don't do that, um, that's no problem. You can download the report at the end of the assessment as well. So what I will do, I will just fill in um, some of the questions and then show you the report that um, it will generate. So first we have some base data um, that, that we ask. Um, we look for um, where you come from, um, if you already have a business idea, um, if you already established your own business before and just have a, a, a new business idea. And it then goes to um, the different sections. So here you can see um, what the assessments covers. Um, so it covers mental and physical aspects, personal characteristics, self-motivation, social environment, um, your personal expertise, and the financial background before starting the business. And we don't have to go into details on the sections now. I will just uh, randomly um, answer questions to show you how the report looks like um, that you receive. So this just takes a couple of seconds. If you do it correctly, it should be around like five minutes. So par parts of the questions are actually um, conditional questions. So um, they only appear, for example, if you already have a business or if you already have a business idea. Um, and then at the end um, allows you to download a report. Um, this might um, take a couple of seconds. I hope the internet connection is fast enough. As I said, as I entered my um, email address, it will also send an email report. We don't use the information, of course, uh, or the data provided um, for any other purposes than just sending your um, feedback report. So then what you will receive is a PDF that gives information um, on your overall score um, of entrepreneurial readiness and then a feedback on the different sections, um, how um, good you actually um, or how prepared you are for self-employment and your own business. It then provides more detail um, on the certain sections. Um, it also provides some general advice um, for on, on that sections and how to improve that. Um, and of course, the, this is also all related to the, um, the content that we have in, in the course. So, um, and then uh, there is an overview about all the questions and how you answer them and a kind of red flag report. And actually, I think that's a um, very interesting added value um, for, for the project because it's really um, an easy, e easy thing to do. It just takes a couple of minutes and, and you see um, areas where you should probably improve before starting your own business.
Thank you, David. Um, and thank you, Orla, uh, for those uh, um, both very in interesting presentations. And I guess what uh, what you'll you'll notice are uh, what Orla has uh, shown there are is a, a, a summary of, of some of the resources that have been prepared. Um, and those can be accessed through our um, web portal, uh, the website, which I'm going to ask Paul if Paul, you didn't mind just to put into the, the chat box uh, again, just so people have that. Um, when you go into that website, you will be able to access all of these resources and the resources that you're, you're going to hear about now in our breakout rooms. Um, those are all freely available and hopefully can be something very um, practical for, for you to take away from this session. And David's self-assessment tool there also is uh, available at that website. When you get, click, click into the website, you can click on to uh, the self-assessment tool and uh, and go through the, the survey the way David showed us there, and it will produce a report for you. Um, and you can share that with anybody that you might be um, working with if you're somebody who works with female migrant entrepreneurs or people in that arena. You can use that and uh, help them to, to uh, do some self-assessment about how they feel they might be ready for self-employment. So um, let me just check what time we're sitting at. So it's just gone to, uh, coming to close to quarter past 11, where we're pretty good on time, uh, just slightly ahead. But I'm going to suggest if we uh, keep to the time that we have set on our um, agenda, and we're going to now break into uh, two breakout rooms, one which will be hosted in the Dutch language and the other in the English language. Uh, these breakout rooms are for the purpose of um, hearing more detail about the resources that we've produced and that will be available. And then uh, we will come back into the main room together uh, at 11.40. So it will be about 25 minutes or so in the breakout rooms. Uh, so we'll come back at 11.40. Uh, Orla will keep us right to time there, I'm sure. <laughs> and uh, uh, when we come back, we will finish the session off uh, with a, a, a bit of a question and answer uh, panel discussion. So please, uh, if you have questions, put them into the chat box and we'll look at that too. And final thing to say is just a reminder of the evaluation. Um, please do remember to complete that uh, when you're um, finishing. Um, the link is in the chat box. So Orla, do you want to do your magic and we'll go into the breakout? Yes, I have... Um... I have created the both rooms and um, I people need to choose which um, which Dutch or, or English. So please choose which room you wish to um, you wish to to join, um, please, if that's OK. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, Ro Roshin is um, has, has been carrying out a lot of, of the research and uh, I have asked her if she would be um, uh, good enough to share some of the key points that has come out of that uh, that research, um, some of the recommendations also that we're making as, as a result of that. Um, so I know that uh, there was a presentation you wanted to share, Roshin. Now, uh, that seems to be okay, Jonathan. I think I can share that. So you have permission to share there, Roshin. Yeah. yeah so it'd be great, best great. if you did your own. Thank you. Yeah, great. Yeah. Okay, yeah. well, look, I'll, I'll leave it to you, Rushing, then if you want to take okay, us Okay, I'll that. do that now. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay, folks, um, sorry about getting kicked out earlier. I don't know what happened. Um, so hopefully it doesn't happen again. You can take over, Jonathan, if it does. So, um, so I'm just going to give a wee bit of an overview. So I was given the task of taking um, four reports on four partner areas and trying to bring it all together. And, and to summarize it, though, I think the summary was 84 pages. So um, um, it's a very quick overview. If you want to look at things in more detail, you can go and download that report and it's there to read. Um, so um, this was actually done um, about a year ago. So I had, I had to go and read it myself because I couldn't remember all, all the detail. And unfortunately, life since then has just been Zoom. So I've been delivering all my training on Zoom. So it's um, it's harder to reach some people through through the online. So um, just the 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 report itself. This is what it covers, guys. Um, it gives an overview of migrants and statistics in each area. 
and um, it gives the key barriers for female migrants to start a business which were very similar in each each country and um, it looks at the support for female migrants in each area um, and gives examples of best practice and then there's some recommendations now i'm not really going to go into point three and four i might mention a couple just we don't have the time in, in this so um we'll just um now let's see will my slides go down oh i'll just do it like that Okay, so um, this is actually included in the report, and this is just a wee bit of a, just to give you context, because, I mean, when we talk about Germany and Netherlands, and then you talk about Northern Ireland, um, it's not really comparable, because we're so wee. Um, you know, we've got a population of 1.9 million, so I tried to just break this down. What is the percentage of the population as migrants, and what is the number of migrants? So, I mean, we can kind of, if you look at that column number of migrants, we can kind of make a guess that about 50% are women. That might vary slightly, you know, but um, it gives you a sort of rough idea. So actually, for Northern Ireland, really, you know, we've only about 130,000 migrants. Now, these figures are 2018, could be a wee bit out of date. We may have had more uh, refugees since then, certainly. Uh, and then we may be losing people, as the case may be, because of Brexit. They're all going to Germany to set up. Um, so, you know, we've only 65,000 women where if you look at Germany, goodness, does that mean there's 7 million women migrants there? So they've got such a big pool of, of women to target um, or, or the Netherlands as well. Um, so another wee, few wee stats there as well is um, just the level of female entrepreneurship in each um, area. So this was taken, I, I mentioned it earlier at the intro, this was taken from the Alison Rose report, which was created by the Royal Bank of Scotland in 2019. So um, this just shows that really Germany, the level of female entrepreneurship is very low because I suppose of high employment and, and big corporates. Um, where you go to the other end is, is Netherlands is 8.5%. So they really were at the top end of the leaderboard in terms of the, the rate of entrepreneurship. Um, the UK is sitting at about 5%. Um, I think Northern Ireland is probably a wee bit lower in that, in that statistic. And Ireland has, done, has had fantastic progress in the past 10 years to improve female entrepreneurship and is sitting at around 6.5%. And um, it is interesting, and some of the, the stuff that I came across in the research just about the different cultures who might move to your country, and, and depending on where they've come from, that does impact on their likelihood of being entrepreneurial, because if you take Syria, there are very high levels of Syrian people who ran a business in their country, in their native country, before they moved to your country, so that, you know, where in, in Chinese communities it's much less, so Iran and Iraq sort of countries, they're very entrepreneurial, so, so that does have a little bit of a factor in, in their likelihood of, of setting up. Um, another wee graph here, um, so this is again taken, this is actually taken from GEMS, and it's, it's a little bit old, 2017, but what it shows here is um, now I'm looking along the, the axis along the bottom here. So the, the axis along the, the vertical axis there along the left, that's actually just what I covered in the last slide. So um, here, if you look to the right, you have Netherlands is up at 0.85. So what this is showing is the ratio of female entrepreneurs to male entrepreneurs. So this is the case. So for every, this would mean for every 10 men that start a business, nearly nine women start a business in the Netherlands. I mean, that is fantastic. So if you can find your country as you move down the board, and so Germany is at, for every 10 men, up about six women start a business. And if you go to Ireland, they're at just between sort of five, five, and you know, maybe Ireland's approved a wee bit since then. UK is the lowest. So we have the, the, the worst uh, reputation there for, for getting started. So, so, you know, the stats are certainly there in terms of the rationale for government intervention um, in that. Um, and just going to shift here. So, um, you know, an awful lot of the barriers for female entrepreneurs and migrant females are the same. But of course, there are added barriers for the migrant females. And that just depends a lot, you know, Orla mentioned about the different, you know, if, you've, if you're second generation and you've been brought up, you know, in, in Netherlands or Germany and you have the language, I mean, it's very, very different to somebody who's moved in as a refugee. 
very, very different experience. Um, now, I have some experience working. I don't have a lot of experience personally working with migrants, apart from on our core mainstream programs for women, you know, about 4% are actually migrant, my, migrants. And um, most of those will have a good command of the English language of a Spanish lady in my program at the minute. But, you know, she's 15 years in in Northern Ireland after she went to Dublin traveling and I met a man from Tyrone and that was the that was her hook hook and corner to live in Northern Ireland. So you know an awful lot of them have good English and that's the big difference and, and they're able to join the mainstream programs and get started no problem. So I mean the barriers for female entrepreneurs we're all very familiar with those. You know it's the child care and caring responsibilities that fall fall onto us. Um, but actually, in the migrant ladies, um, that is even bigger because there are plenty of men who who work part time or stay at home and take more of those responsibilities in 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 Europe. Um, but in in like Syrian ladies, there's no way that's going to happen. Muslim ladies, no way, and they also care for their elderly as well. They're, that's their responsibility too. Um, attitude to risk, yes. Um, women are shown to be less inclined to borrow money, to seek investment, to get investment, um, and and confidence issues are there too. Um, access to finance and securing investment, networks and support. So you know a lot of a lot of countries have been very active in trying to create female networking groups, access to role models. I'm a great advocate of role models. Um, uh, and that you, and the role models need to be relevant to you as well. You know, if I was going in and working in an area where, where there's high unemployment, there's no point in me bringing in a role model with a woman who's, you know, had a third level education and went straight into a great job. It has to it has to be what people identify with. So for our, our migrant ladies, it's got to be these, these migrant role models. And I mean, that was the, the German example there was fantastic. But again, if you're working with refugees, there's no point in bringing a lady who came from the UK who is obviously very educated and was able to, to set up that superb business. Um, additional bars for migrant females. So the language, um, I mean, I, I think it's not just the language, but it's the business language. And this came across in some of the practical research that I did as well, is that some people actually said, um, yes, language is a problem but it's actually then what is the right language for writing a business letter for making a sales call for for um your customer service for writing a social media post and it actually one one um nice best practice example i came across locally here in belfast was actually a group belfast unemployed resource center and they have this this guy who's retired who's running a program voluntarily um, and it's it's language it's it's english for business so what he's doing is he's teaching English, but what he's doing, he has them writing a sales pitch, um, making a, a role play to make a phone call, um, a social media post. So he's actually teaching business startup through um, a, a, what there is called a language course. So very clever. But again, no money for these things. He's running this voluntarily. Um, culture. I mean, I think this is massive. You'll all agree, anybody who's out there and worked with with women, men uh, from migrant backgrounds, culture is huge, but particularly for women, the restrictions on them. Um, you know, I went up to groups and did did interviews with them. And, you know, for some of the Muslims, they weren't allowed to go on courses without the permission of their husband. They have to wear a certain dress. Um, they weren't allowed to leave their children with, they could only leave their children with Muslim women. Um, they weren't allowed to be in the same room as a man over the age of 12. Um, I mean, they, these are huge, um, uh, oh, but also then there's the more subtle things like in their home country, they did not work. They maybe were rural and um, they, they left school at 13 uh, and, you know, ran the house. Um, you know, so what so culture is tied to education as well. It's tied to work experience. Um, um, so that there is all very different. So it affects. OK, <laughs> so it affects a, a woman's confidence, you know, because it affects her skills and, and, and her motivation. I certainly also did find when I did interviews, I did interview um, one of your groups, Jonathan, the New Beginnings group. And I found that the men were much more outspoken and much more. I just got a, a much more motivation and drive that they wanted to, to work and get jobs. But maybe it's the role of 
men in society from where they've come from. The men worked and the woman, women stayed at home. So they're just maybe 30 years behind us. Uh, we've moved on a bit. So um, their right to work, I mean, obviously massive barriers with just are they allowed to work? Do they have the permits? Um, I did meet some women who had run a cafe in their previous country and, and things like that, but they hadn't got through the right um, work permit to allow them to work. So those barriers are there. Um, recognition of qualifications. I think um, the lady who, who was doing the music said that she had to study again. And that's that's um, another difficulty. People coming in here who actually are really qualified engineers and, and lawyers and teachers and they can't work because their qualifications aren't recognized. The benefits trap, um, we, for anyone who doesn't understand what I mean by that, but that is really where I spoke to some women who said, well, my, um, I get income from the government and they also pay for my housing rent. So, you know, in order to give those up, if I started a business, you know, you, I would need to make a certain amount of money to, to, to give those up. And as you know, the first 12 months of running any business, it, it can be difficult. You really need another income. You need savings. You need a redundancy. You need a partner you can rely on. So that is a difficult thing for startups if they're not on some sort of scheme. And legislation, I think there was a was it a, a lady in Sudan said to me, um, yes, she, what did she say? She said, in Sudan, we just start to sell. You just, you know, put up a stall and start, start to sell your products. And she said, there, there are some rules, but everyone ignores them. So that doesn't uh, go down quite as well here. So legislation, you know, they're not familiar tax and compliance and you know, certificates and getting permission from the council or, or whatever it is. So so that's another massive thing. So they have a whole a whole additional um, lot of barriers. And for some, I think for the refugees, if anybody's working for refugees, I think we have to be really realistic um, that, that refugees, you know, a lot of them I met, they're dealing with massive trauma, health issues um, and the language issues. Um, so trying to start a business in that environment so i mean if i was at the money to run a program i would be going in more pre-enterprise and doing social economy type activity letting them build their confidence build their language have fun experience enterprise without having to rely on income coming in and that's the way i would approach it but to actually expect startups i think is, is would be very very challenging so just finally i want to just touch on some of the recommendations that that i sort of pulled together coming from each each area and what everybody said was one thing is just if you are going to run any sort of a program that you need to be working with an organization that works daily weekly with migrants and i know the new beginnings program did, did that paul you had some examples of, of partnerships approach on that and i think that's really key because um, you know, normally if I was running a program for female entrepreneurs, I can do some Facebook and Instagram ads and I'll fill my places, no problem. But that doesn't really work. They seem to really rely on WhatsApp groups and, and word of mouth in their community. So that, that's the way you have to recruit people. Um, another point is to deliver in their community. So you can't expect women you know, if I think of some of the women I met, um, trying to take them out of that safe environment, they need to go to the local women's centre, the local community organisation. You need to be placed where they live. They're not going to get two buses to go to the university outside the city. Um, role models I've mentioned, trying to create a pool of role models that are relevant to them and also how you use role models. So um, I run a programme at the minute and the way we use role models is it's not about them coming in and doing a wee, a wee 10 minute talk. Oh, this is what I achieved. Because sometimes actually that's really scary. That just makes the role model sound amazing. And the person sitting on the course thinks, how could I ever be like them? So what we do, we bring in role models and they sit with small groups of two or three women and they discuss their business ideas with them. And they give them advice and ideas and they brainstorm with them how to improve that. And I would have the same group of four role models in, in any programs I run come three times and spend a total of nine hours working with the women. So that's how I use role models. Um, and they actually, and the role models all do it for free and they actually love it. They all get so much out of it. So um, just I mentioned about refugees, be realistic whenever you're working with refugees because of they've all these additional challenges to deal with. Um, starting by selling in their own community is a very typical way to start and that is good 
although it is then you need to move them outside the community, especially if they want to develop their language skills. Um, um, because if they're going to, you know, just sell within their own community, that won't work. And also there is great opportunities to sell, you know, if you have um, particular types like Syrian food, you know, there's there could be opportunities that people like to taste new things and, and new tastes. Um, um, another thing I think, uh, you know, there's a bit of a chicken and egg situation here. They don't have enough language to run a business. But if they if they don't try and do something in employ, employment or self-employment, they don't tend to advance their language skills. The women tend to pick up the children at school and um, go to the local shop and they speak to their local neighbours and they just stay in their own community so the language doesn't improve. So, so match the two together and push them out. This is why I love the team approach of doing things because you'll always have somebody who's a bit stronger at language than others and can help them move forward. Um, and I really believe in trying to keep training practical. And I know that the resource that you've created there is fantastic in terms of your training materials and brilliant examples and case studies. And that's brilliant. But the other side of it is it's dependent on the group that trying to keep your training practical and not overload them with PowerPoint slides. So um, I see um, Mag Maggie's on here somewhere and um, I know I spoke to her. Maggie did run a, a programme locally for some women and a number of them were migrants and, and had to really change her training materials um, to use more vi visuals such as cartoon sketches or videos to engage them. Um, I, I would try to use workbooks a lot and discussion groups, but I don't know that it depends on the group that you can just you know, um, leave them to it. You kind of will have to facilitate that and support them as well. And to understand the, the English or the business jargon that may be in those. Um, get them to work in a group. We mentioned that pop-up shop, a market stall, an event that they can sell things. I remember with a group of groups of unemployed women, and um, these weren't migrants, but they were women with a lot of barriers. And what we did is at the end of the program, they had to go and um, even sell, sell buns and cakes in their community or... or they, they ran a car boot sale or something actually to make them feel the buzz of selling. Because when you sell and get that money into your hand, even if it's just going back into the community, they get such a buzz and that will motivate them to go on maybe to more a more formalized program. And um, keep the structure light. Um, I feel that women, um, women are not good at going on a, you know, a three day full, full day program um, or something over two and three weeks. They like things to go on for three, four or five months. They like you to keep in touch with them. Certainly what I do, I would be in touch with my women every week through a Facebook groups directly. How are you doing? How are you getting on? How are you getting on with your mentoring? And that, given them that space, because you have to remember they're juggling children, they're juggling maybe part-time jobs, they have other things going on. And also having that space to think about the idea, think about the product, think about the branding. Let's try and do a social media post. So just not the intense approach and a lot of the great, the good practice out there were programs that ran for you know two to four months um so that point i've just mentioned and build in peer support so peer support what that means for us your peers obviously are the, the people the other people on the course and we try to get them to support each other um so that that whole idea that orla was mentioned about collaboration but it's not just about saying, oh, well done. Oh, we, oh, you've developed your branding or your logo. Oh, well done. It's not just about saying, well done. It's actually working on each other's business ideas. So, you know, let's all work on, um, on one idea of one person. Now let's work on the next idea. And because anyone starting a business, working on your own in isolation, as you've probably maybe more of you felt from being on Zoom and being out of the office, Ideas don't flow the same. We can be productive on our own, but ideas don't flow. So you need to get them into those groups to discuss each other's ideas, to create that creativity and drive and the motivation. So that's just a quick overview, guys. Um, I don't think we'll probably time for, for questions, Jonathan, but lots of fantastic uh, best practice stuff out there. And I just I just think it's pity, you know, that a lot of them, you know, are ad hoc and they happen once and they're not continual. But hopefully this resource you have created will will spur on um, more more targeted programs at um, migrant females. Oh, I'll stop. Thanks, sharing. Roshi. Yeah, no, listen, uh, yeah, if you stop sharing there. Thank you. And that gives a good overview of the 
uh, the key uh, information that we gathered through that output and the recommendations that are contained there. And I would uh, um, encourage uh, people to log on to our, our website where you'll see the resource in full and uh, you'll be able to um, download that, review that, and also use that in your own context because there's plenty of really good information there for the development design of, of your own um, programs and interventions. Which brings me uh, to Orla, uh, who will give you a wee bit of an overview of the intervention that we've designed, uh, addressing and coming from that research background. So Orla, over to you. Brilliant. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Um, I'm moving from the classroom course into the self-learning section. Um, and um, this is where uh, people can go um, and access the materials, but not just PowerPoint, exactly as Roisin has said. This is where the magic happens. This is where the interaction happens. This is where, you know, um, real connections and real uh, progress can be made. So um, our colleagues in Denmark, the European eLearning Institute, have established a knowledge exchange platform on our website, um, eminentproject.eu. And that basically is um, to encourage that this collaboration, promote communication and encourage, you know, um, the fertilization of, of ideas which accelerate learning. One very small example of that is we have a closed Facebook group, which is a very safe space for women to share their ideas and discuss um, issues that are, you know, um, uh, pertinent and stuff so that that group is very very successful and and Paul in Muscama has done a lot of work to build up and I know Katty is a member and we have you know so that's there long after this project will be completed um to to accompany the training materials but basically it's about a virtual a female migrant entrepreneurship cluster so Paul you might put you uh, ask ask you to put that Facebook group face Group, book group uh, address into the chat. <laughs> Language issues, yeah, absolutely. Um, so um, basically, so it you know it's 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 really to augment the training that's available um, to this that that this knowledge exchange platform is uh, created. So basically, the platform has is available as I said <laughs> earlier in three languages, um, which is fantastic. Um, each <laughs> bless you. Uh, each platform has the same functionality, but obviously we're, we're showcasing today in English. There's seven individual um, pieces, I suppose, of this knowledge exchange, and and where where you know women can uh, can help each other and encourage each other and inspire each other. Um, oops, sorry. So basically, um, you will see the uh, screen there is actually just um, replicating the landing page of the uh, website. It, it ends up with the learning modules, which are the modules that I introduced you to earlier, but in self-learning mode. So you don't have to be in a classroom. You can do these um, uh, single on, on your own. But basically, we have recorded lots of virtual talks um, spotlighting women that are doing particularly innovative work. So we have interviews, we have blogs. Uh, I know that Katia's blog from Roscommon was the most uh, most popular blog on our whole um, of, of the whole two year project and received thousands and thousands of of, of views, etc. So it just shows you how people are hungry and others are hungry for information about other women that are doing particularly well. We have special interest groups. And finally, we end up with the learning modules that I that I mentioned earlier. Um, so basically, I suppose, you know, these are about self-learning um, and it's meant to be flexible that you can dip in and out of these, out of the six steps of the entrepreneurship journey um, at, at, at a time and, and place that suits yourself. They're optimized for mobile, so they can be learned on a mobile phone. Um, what's, what's really useful about the materials is that they're full of activities, exercises, case studies, so that you're, it's not going to be a boring start your own business course. This is about getting very real about your business idea and, and taking it forward. Um, 
So as I mentioned, this is the uh, closed Facebook group. I think we have more members than it mentions there now. Um, you can ask to join it. It's completely private and GDPR compliant. Um, and because many of our target group um, would be familiar with Facebook, we felt it was was probably the most accessible place to start. All of us are uh, um, partners are admin of the of the group, so that you know you're you're sure that there's no spam, etc. So it's a very safe, nurturing environment to 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 be involved in. Mm. The knowledge exchange workshops, again, interviewing female migrant entrepreneurs um, that have been through the startup journey. Each interview has was, was done as a live webinar and there's lots of questions and answers opportunities are, are, are included. Um, so we have interviews available in English and in German. Um, Innovation. So these are innovation ventures show and tell. So it's um, a, a video case study, I suppose, of um, practical insights into business operations and, and the history and background as to how women started their business. But I think people people buy people at all stages. So I think when we can relate to, you know, the startup journeys of others, it really can help us, um, I suppose, put ourselves in those shoes and work out, you know, where we um, can, can progress. Virtual talks are um, very short, five to ten minute uh, discussions, I suppose, um, on a range of different topics that are relevant to business startups, but they're all about championing successful female migrant um, entrepreneurs. Um, the blogs are there, as I said, really, really um, fantastic uh, response. There's 36 in total. And um, so others like Katia are uh, profiled and um, you know are, are, are there to be um, relished and enjoyed um, special interest groups um, I I'm rushing now because we're, we're getting I suppose to, 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 to come back into the main room but lots of connections to other resources are really really important so um, that's all good and as I said the um, final piece is self-learning modules which are there to be um, enjoyed at, at your own time. So that is a very whistle stop tour of the what we call in Erasmus speak as IO3 but um, is, is obviously the uh, self-learning tools for all our, our um, female migrant uh, entrepreneurs of the future. Okay that's Thank, thank you, Orla. And, um, and I, I really would encourage people, uh, I mean, we, we can't give full justice in the time we have here to the, the depth of those resources. Um, there really is a wealth of information uh, on there and it's on the website, which uh, Paul will put again up into our uh, chat, chat function. Um, it's information there that you can use uh, and adapt in your own way, whether it be to self-teach uh, if it's something that you're interested in as an individual to develop or whether it is as a an educator uh, to utilize those materials to be able to uh, present to your own um, and in your own courses in your own interventions so please do take the time to uh, download those from the from the website but we will we will take us back into the main room now uh, and we are coming to the close of the uh, event so i'll see you at the other side and Perfect. We'll